Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Tremendous Leadership Podcast, Leaders on Leadership. Our guest today is Jerry Balloon. Jerry is an editor, he's a reporter, he's a newspaper owner and publisher. Jerry is the former president of the South Carolina Press Association and was named Journalist of the Year. Jerry has a phenomenal career, decades in the editing and publishing and reporting journalistic industry, and has a great perspective on what it takes to pay the price of leadership. You're listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tracy Jones, and welcome to the Tremendous Leadership Podcast, Leaders on Leadership, where we pull back the curtain on leadership and talk with leaders all over the world about what it took them to pay the price of leadership. And today, I am tremendously excited because my guest is Jerry Balloon. And Jerry Balloon coached editors and reporters at more than two dozen newspapers across the country. He is the editor of two magazines, and he started a newspaper executive search firm. In 1984, he and his wife bought a failing weekly newspaper, The Dispatch, in Lexington, South Carolina, and they quickly turned it into a highly profitable, award-winning newspaper. After disagreements with the majority partner, the balloons left the Dispatch News and launched the Lexington County Chronicle in 1992. After nine years of competition between the two local newspapers, the owner of the Dispatch News asked them to buy him out. So then in 2006, Jerry was semi-retired from the Chronicle, and his son Mark succeeded him as editor. In retirement, Balloon started Riverbanks Press, I want to talk about that, publishing 11 books and self-study courses. Jerry is the former president of the South Carolina Press Association and has been named its Journalist of the Year. He is a longtime member of the National Speakers Association and Toastmasters International, for which he has helped establish three chapters and served as president and area governor. Wow. Jerry, thank you so much. We are so excited to hear your perspective on the price of leadership. Thank you, Tracy. Tremendous, Tracy. You are so welcome, Jerry. And I love getting your weekly newsletter and I can't wait to hear, you just sent me some of your books, so we're gonna talk all about that. But Jerry, my father, one of the most um, requested and most often speeches that he gave in his life was a speech titled The Price of Leadership. And we even have a little book that talks about that. My father always talked about, you know, he was passionate about leadership. That leadership is what gives us a purpose for life and we're all called to lead at something. But there's also a price Price you have to pay. And it's a daunting price. And that's why a lot of times with leaders, uh, a lot of people will step up to the leadership plate and then see the price they have to pay. And they will say, no, 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 this was a little more than I bargained for. So in it, my father talks about three key or four key tenets of leadership and the price you have to pay. And the first price that he talks about in paying the price of leadership is loneliness. And a lot of our listeners have heard, you know what, it's lonely at the top. Uh, Probably most of our leadership folks that are listening know that there are times where you truly feel alone or lonely. And Jerry, could you unpack loneliness? You've had an extensive career across many different industries. Can you unpack for us as a leader what loneliness has meant through you for you throughout your career, and maybe share some times where you were in that season of loneliness and some um, tips that you would recommend to our other leaders out there. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. I've just finished reading a book I recommend to you and your readers uh, by David McCullough. He's a historian, but he doesn't write dry history textbooks. He writes books about the people who live the story he's he's telling. Okay. This one is called 1776. So yeah. you can imagine that it was about the American Revolution and George Washington and John Adams and Ben Franklin and Thomas Jefferson and uh, Nathaniel Green and all of those real heroes who mm-hmm. place their lives, their property, their families, uh, at great peril yes. to um, 
tell King George and the British Parliament where they could stick it. But uh, one of the things that uh, really struck me in reading about uh, Washington, he had had very limited uh, experience in directing troops. He had fought in the French and Indian War as a British officer. But uh, when the Continental Congress asked him if he would become commander of the Continental Army, he, he was hesitant at first. He considered, of course, quite a, an honor that they were bestowing on him. But as he wrote Martha Custis Washington, his, his wife, he said, I really feel ill-equipped for this job, mm. but I'm determined to do my best. And he talked a lot about the loneliness of command. Mm. My experience has been considerably different from that. Uh, I know that one of my first real leadership experiences was uh, in the United States Army Infantry in Korea back in the 50s. And I was a squad leader. And when we would go on patrol, whether it was at night or during the day, I always preferred the day because you could see where you were going. And you might not step on a line, landmine. But I always felt like, you know, I wanted to take the point. I wanted to be out front. I, I wanted, if something happened, I didn't want my, my guys to get it before I got it. Mm. And you know, I was 19 years old. Um, but I always felt like being on the point also, I had the team behind me. You know, mm -hmm. it, you know sure, it was kind of lonely out there because you, know, you didn't quite know where the enemy was or he may have thought you knew where it was and he may not have been. But I've always felt throughout my, my career and my experience in leadership that I connected both above me and below me. So I always had a great support group. Mm -hmm. So I never felt really lonely. And then when I met my wife, we were both editors on a newspaper in South Carolina. And we both worked at night, so we didn't have much social life. But and I think that may be, have drawn us together. Uh -huh. but she, she was an Air Force brat. I know you spent your time in the Air Force. I did. And, and you know, she, she is, she is my ideal female leader. Uh, uh, her judgment, her savvy, her um, ability to read people is much sharper than mine. Wow. So I've always felt like I had a true partner and companion, not just a wife, who was always there with me too. So the, you know, there have been times, I remember, when we started the Chronicle, we were supposed to, on, on our strategic business plan, we were supposed to break into the black and be profitable in the 10th month. Mm -hmm. Well, not a lot of businesses are able to break into the black that early. You know, some right. of them, two, three, four. I think Jeff Bezos and Amazon went some like 15 years mm -hmm. before they were really profitable. And of course, now you can see what they've become. But I remember waking up one morning, early one morning, like three, four o'clock. And I was lying there in bed and we had not, the 10th month had passed and we were still in the red. Now we had reserve funds, our own life savings. Right, we like most gone, business people. We could have gone another six months if we had to. But I thought, what have we gotten ourselves into? Uh-huh. Well, no. Are we in danger of, of, of losing our dream? Right. And my wife was over there lying in bed beside me, uh, sleeping blissfully. And I thought, why are you over there sleeping? Why aren't you worried with me? And I, I think, well, that was a really lonely moment, you know. And I thought to myself, well, she's there. I think this was God talking to me. She's there sleeping blissfully because she has not given up the dream. Oh. Still very real to her. She wow. still believes that we're going to be profitable. 
and that we're going to succeed beyond our wildest dreams. And at that I thought, you're just being foolish. Go back to sleep. And I have not worried about it since. We did break into the black 30 days later. We haven't looked back since. COVID-19 has put a hole below the water line, but we got it patched. Right. Our bottom line is not as good as it was this time last year. Right. But very few people are. Look at right. Disney World. Look at Ford Motors. Right. Look at, right. you know. So, but you know, we've got money in the bank. We, we're still profitable. You know, it's, you know, maybe we were profitable like this last year and we're profitable like this this year. But we're still profitable. I looked at our numbers for year to date and July last night. Our bookkeeper just got back from her honeymoon. So I got the July figures a little later than I normally do. And we're profitable on the year. We're profitable on the month. There is a, there is a loss. We, I mean, compared to last year, mm -hmm. we're not making near as much money as we did. But right. One of the things that has always, I think, driven my wife and me is it's not the money. It's the meaning of what you give to the community and to your customers and to your staff. Mm -hmm. And if you take care of them, they will take care of you. Okay. Beautiful. I love now, that. Enough about loneliness. Let's talk yeah. about loneliness. Yeah, let's talk. Okay, so now I love that. And I love that you said that she had not yet, she had not given up on the dream, and that's the last, that's the last you thought about. I love that. And 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 Jerry, it's so beautiful because you know. <clears throat> we're still business people. We still have to look at the numbers, but I love that you just, you know, you, you do what you do, that you do the best you can do. And what, what good is worrying about it going to do? You know no, what I'm saying? Not, no, no, no. Not a lick of beans. change a thing. Right. right. Not, not all you action, can do. Action and strategic thought is going to change things. Absolutely. Sitting around and a woe, oh, woe is me is not going to do anything. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. And I love that you look at your wife, not just as a life partner, but as a, a, a leader that you look at and value her input. I mean, that's huge. Uh, that, be very beautifully put. Okay. So now the second price that my dad talked about was weariness. Okay. So, I mean, it, you know, we're, we're still pressing on, we're still looking for the next big thing. My dad always said retirement was a dirty word. He's like, retire. Yeah. Are you kidding me? We still have so much more to do in life. How do you stay? Um, how do you stay refreshed? Um, cause you know, it, there are ebbs and flows with everything. How do you stay strong and, and active and engaged and, um, energetic? Well, I really do believe that whatever talent and energy and, um, cussed stubbornness is in me, uh, is a divine gift. And so I, I not only want to take care of my brain, I want to take care of my body. Mm -hmm. I work out every morning. Now I worked out with a personal trainer until February when right. gyms were closed. So I work out on my own. I do Pilates, I do core exercises, I use weights at home. I work out uh, every morning for 40 to 45 minutes. I think that's really important to keep my energy level up, to keep myself physically fit. I try to eat right. Uh, I'm a low carb, low fat guy. Uh, eat a lot of uh, fruits and vegetables. Eat lean meat. Eat a lot of fish and chicken. Uh, I think I'm gonna make a shrimp, Italian shrimp dish, a Mediterranean shrimp dish tonight with pasta. Uh, I like to cook. Uh, my wife cooked the first 20 years of our marriage. And after that, she said, uh, it's your turn. You and the boys <laughs> take over the kitchen. Uh, so that was 36 years ago. Uh, and she will cook at uh, Christmas and Thanksgiving, uh, birthdays, special occasions. And she's a beautiful, wonderful cook. Her mother was a, a worked for Clemson University as a, uh, she coached farm wives and young wives on uh, the economics of managing a household, how to cook, how to 
clean, how to shop smartly. Um, so, and she passed a lot of that on to, to my, my bride. Uh, but my, my sons and I enjoy cooking and, and we have a lot of fun doing it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's not a chore for me. After 20 years, it became a chore for her. <laughs> uh, but um, I, I also, of course, we both read a lot. Uh, right. She's, she's got me uh, trying to give away most of uh, about 15,000 books we've got in this house. Mm -hmm. uh, so I take them and I give them to the friends of the library. I give Beautiful. them to, uh, there's a little God's, uh, his house up the street that has, that sells books for like 10 cents a piece, 25 cents a piece. I give some of the more popular paperbacks to them because I think that's their audience. Mm -hmm. I give the uh, uh, nonfiction, motivational books, uh, stuff like that. Kind of stuff like, like Charlie. Right. Charlie's speeches that you've turned into books. Right. I, I love I love the price of leadership. Great great book, and he had three wonderful questions. I'm gonna write a column about those those three questions. Excellent. Why, why am I here? And you know the other two. Right. But I feel like part of my responsibility as a child of God is to take care of what He's given me, mm. and I thank Him every morning. I say, you know. Mine is almost like the Lord's Prayer. I mean, it's memorized. I thank him for all the blessings I know I don't deserve, but that he gives me with love. I thank him for all the opportunities he gives me. Mm. And I ask him to help me keep my mind and my heart open so that I will recognize the opportunities when they come. And I can make, with his guidance, I can make good decisions about what to do with them. I thank him for the challenges because they test my character and they make me become more analytical and strategic in my thinking. And I thank him for whatever guidance he can give me in dealing with the challenges. Mm -hmm. Ask him to help me resist temptations. And I have my share just like everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, to, to put Lucifer from behind me, um, I, th I thank him for being inside me, mm. him and Jesus and the Holy Spirit. I know that they're always with me and that they will guide me if I will listen to them. So, Lord, please help me keep my eyes and ears and all my senses tuned to what you have to tell me. And then I ask in Jesus' precious name, I'm in. And that's, yeah. that's my morning prayer yeah. when the dogs and I are out for a walk at 6 a.m. So. I love that. And you know what? Almost every leader, I think every single leader has talked about that time in the morning, the importance of health, but also that just centering on God and realizing who you have with you. And boy, if that doesn't give you a kick of energy and peace and <clears throat> I got this, you know, I, I, I'm not doing this on my own. I mean, just, right. just what beautiful wisdom. Thank you, Jerry, for sharing that. Well, I, love it. I always, always think of that great painting of Christ in Gethsemane. He knows what's going to happen in the next three days. Yes. He knows it's going to be a terrible physical ordeal. Yes. For, for him as a person. Right. This, right. Son of God, but also son of man. And or son of Mary. And he's asking God to give him the strength to endure it, to get through it, to do what has to be done to forgive all of our sins. So you know, when I think about prayer, I think of him in Gethsemane and what he was facing. And I think how lucky I am that my challenges are going to be in this life, probably nothing like that. Right. Wow. Uh, absolutely beautiful, Jerry. Thank you for that. All right. So dad talked about loneliness. We covered weariness. The next point he talked about was abandonment. And in it, he, you know, we, we've, we've, those of us with the entrepreneurial spirit, we never have a shortage of things that we like to focus on or hear the next greatest idea. But my father really talked about abandonment of um, getting rid of what you want and like to think about in favor of what you need and ought to 
focus on. So really, I look at abandonment as this hyper focus, and it's so easy to mission drift or go, well, I don't know if this is working. Maybe I should I should do that. So can you explain to me how you stay? You 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 have had this vision from the minute you got into your field and you stayed focused on your business and been very successful at it. How did you maintain that sense of abandonment and focus, Jerry? Well, I, th I think of it as, as decluttering your life. Okay. And my wife is uh, my my wife is a great aid to me in that. Uh, she says, for instance, I talked about our book collection, and I love those books. You know, I, I have an index in the back of it, it's a self-written index. That if I find a, an idea on page thirty-nine that I really, really like, you know, I'll underline it or I'll highlight it with a yellow highlighter, and I'll write in the back of the book, you know. Strategy number 14. Wow. Uh, blah, 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 page 39. So when I pick up that book again later, I can look in the back and here I've got a, an index of maybe the 20 best ideas in that book, and I know exactly where they are. Mm -hmm. If I'm going to give a speech about, say, leadership, I'll go, I've got a collection of probably 100 books on leadership. Everybody who's ever written a book about leadership in some by you and your dad. Um, I'll go look through some of them and say, you know, what have I not talked about lately? Love it. That, or if I'm looking to write a, a newspaper column on the, I'll read, write a weekly that called, column called The Editor Talks With You. And it's a very personal dialogue between me and, and our we just wrote about 30,000 readers. And, and they respond to it. At the end of the column, I always say, I'd like to hear what you think about what we've been just talking about. And I get emails from them. I get handwritten letters from them. Here's one that just came in today. Uh -huh. And he copied something off the internet on the back of it that he wanted me to read. So, uh -huh. yeah, I, I get maybe five or six letters like this a week. Well, Beautiful. there's a dialogue going on there. Yes. Getting back to abandonment, my wife, who is my severest critic and my most loyal supporter, says, we got to get rid of some of these books. Your desk is just a mess. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go clean up, you know, save the stuff that needs to be saved, throw away the stuff that you no longer need, uh, but declutter your life mm -hmm. so that you've got more time to spend with me. So that's that's my take on abandonment is I love it. Get the get the trash out of your life. Right. Keep the keep the stuff that's really important. Right. Absolutely. Such great insights. Okay. And the last point he talked about, Jerry, was loneliness, weariness, abandonment. And then he talks about the fourth price of leadership is vision. And uh, I think vision is kind of one of these words that scares most of us mere mortals. Like, I don't know, am I a visionary? I don't know. Um, but my father really talked about vision as simply seeing what needs to be done and then doing it. Because a lot of people are good at talking about vision, but vision has that integration and execution. So how do you gain uh, vision on what's next? How do you gain um, clarity on, on where to go next? Well, let me tell you a little personal story. Mm -hmm. This goes back many years ago after I, uh, after I got out of the army and uh, went back to college and got a job on a daily newspaper in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Charles Carroll was one of my colleagues. Uh, wow. Marion Hargrove, the guy who wrote See Here, Private Hargrove, which was a bestseller back in the 40s. It was about his experiences in the Army in World War II. Hmm. Uh, he later became a movie and television producer. Um, th that was the kind of people I was working with at, at this newspaper. And I had a, a good friend uh, in my hometown uh, in South Carolina. And he and I had been talking about um, doing some writing together. He was a playwright. And I thought I would, my long-term goal was really to kind of follow Ernest Hemingway and 
John Steinbeck's model, get into journalism, get a good taste of life and experience, learn the journalistic skills of interviewing and research and gathering information, and then become a novelist. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the, that was the dream. Well, looking back on it, I know that novelists live, live really pretty lonely lives. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, it's kind of monastic, you know. Hemingway would get up at five o'clock in the morning when nobody was around bothering him and write for four or five hours. Then he had, of course, the rest of the day to do go fishing or hunting or whatever else he wanted to do. But I thought, I thought many times since, God, you spared me a lonely life. You got me into journalism where I work with people. And I'm a people person. Mm -hmm. And I think you are too. Mm -hmm. And I mean that as a sincere compliment. Mm -hmm. But I, uh, while I was, so uh, I took a year off. I, I, I told my boss, I said, you know, I want to take an unpaid sabbatical. And if you want me back at the end of the year and I'm not uh, already in demand uh, as a playwright, novelist, and whatever, I'll come back and work for you. So um, I took a year off. and Joe and I wrote um, a movie script, full, full length movie script based on an experience he had in World War II. He was older than me. And I was writing a novel at the time about my experiences in Korea as a infantry grunt. Mm -hmm. And um, so he and I came up with uh, three concepts for television series. One of them was really intriguing. It was called The Infamous. And it was about people who were infamous, Adolf Hitler. Hojo, uh, some who were kind of quasi-infamous, Napoleon, mm -hmm. Blackbeard, uh, but these were hour-long scripts that were history as live drama. Mm -hmm. and this was back uh, during what I would call the golden age of television when there was a lot of live drama and comedy mm -hmm. on television. It's all canned now. But Anyway, we went to New York and we found an agent with the William Morris Agency who agreed to represent us. And we went happily back to South Carolina working on scripts and sending them off to New York. And after a while, the guy wouldn't even return our phone calls. And after a while, I was starting to run out of money. So I started, I called my old editor in Charlotte and he said, yeah, come on up, let's talk. And a friend of mine, a, a fraternity brother, uh, had worked at the state newspaper in Columbia. And he told me, he said, there's an editor down there, Lloyd Huntington, that you ought to meet. He's looking for people like you. Well, I knew if I went back to Charlotte, I was still going to be treated like the kid I was when I first went to work. Uh -huh. I mean, the first boss never gets over that picture of you as the greenhorn that right. you once were. I wasn't a greenhorn anymore. I worked for him for three years. Covered cops, courts, murders, you name it, right? And so <coughs> I, I called Roy and I said, I understand you're looking for an editor. And he said, I am. He said, uh, why don't you come on down here and let's talk. Well, I had... He was in Columbia, South Carolina. I'd gone to Carolina, so I was familiar with his newspaper, both the morning and the afternoon newspaper. This was back when there were afternoon newspapers. Mm -hmm. So I left home at 5 a.m. and drove to Columbia so I could get down here in time to go to the newsstand and get that morning's issue of the state and the afternoon before his issue of the Columbia Record and read them before I went to see Lloyd. I wanted to know what they were doing. I wanted to see how good it was. I wanted to see what I might suggest him to improve them. I wanted to be able to have a conversation with him about his problem. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had more kids come in, and I even send them copies of our newspaper, and I said, 
read this and have three ideas for me about what you would do if you came to work with us to make it a better reading experience for our readers or a better sales experience for our advertisers. Some of them don't even bother to do it. So the first question I ask is, well, what do you think of the paper? Well, I didn't really have time to read it. I say, Joe, let me tell you something. If you're serious about working with us, you go home and read the paper. And after you read the paper, you sit down and you write down three things that you want to tell me that I should be doing to make this a better newspaper. Huh. And then you call me, and we'll get back together again. Wow. Never hear from them. A lot of them, I never hear from them after I send them the paper. Mm -hmm. Just a little note that says, be ready to give me three ideas as to how we can make this a better newspaper. So anyway, I went in to see Lloyd. Great guy. The only thing in his, um, his desk was clean. I've never seen an editor with a clean desk, I thought. The only thing, there was a picture of his family <coughs> on the wall, and on the credenza behind him were, must have been 20 tennis trophies. And he looked like a tennis player. Mm -hmm. Tan, lean, uh, looked like he could kick you know what and take names. And we sat down, we sat down on a little table in his office. He didn't get behind the, hide behind the desk. Sat down very collegially, and he said, well, he said, have you had a chance to read the state? And I said, yes, sir. And I read the Columbia Record, too. He said, what do you think is the better newspaper? I said, do you want the truth? He said, I do. I said, I think the Columbia Record is the better newspaper. Now, I know the state is the flagship morning newspaper. In, in circulation, you've probably got four times the readership of the Columbia Record. But the record is different. I said, it's more like the Charlotte News. Hmm. It's, it's personal. It tells stories in a personal way. Hmm. It addresses the reader. It asks him questions. Sit back and he had the big smile on his face. And he said, well, let me tell you, the publisher lets me do whatever I want to do with the record. But he wants the state to be the majestic monarch of the Carolinas. He wants it to be a newspaper of thundering influence. Mm -hmm. And all I want to do is I don't want to take the thunder away. I just want to warm it up a little bit for our readers. And he said, if you come to work for me on the state, maybe you could help me warm it up. And he sat back and he began to talk with me about his vision of a newspaper that embraced its readers, that tried to make a complicated world understandable, that talked in terms that readers could understand, that didn't use 25 cent and 50 cent words, but like Winston Churchill, use the lame old one and two syllable Anglo-Saxonisms. I thought, man, I hope you're going to offer me that job because this is the kind of guy I want to work for. Six months later, and this is the beginning of a novel I'm writing. Six months later, he collapsed in the hall with a stroke and died. I mean, it was, the staff of both newspapers was just destroyed their morale. Then a few weeks after the funeral came the office politics. People were jockeying for the move up. You know, if the managing editor moved up to executive editor and the assistant managing editor move up to managing editor. And the city editor would move up to assistant, assistant managing editor. And I sat back and I watched all this going on. What horse, Bucky? I didn't come down here 
play politics. I came down here to edit a great newspaper. Mm -hmm. So I'm staying out of that. And I did. Well, a month after that, the publisher and the board decided to do something very unusual. <clears throat> they took the guy who was in charge of state house coverage. We had three reporters, including himself, covering the South Carolina State House. One covered the House, one covered the Senate, and one covered the governmental agencies. And their job was to have a <coughs> bless you. Their Thanks. job was to have a page one story for me to put on page one every day. Mm -hmm. Something that would grab people's attention about what legislators were doing with their tax money. Mm -hmm. what stupid regulations were being imposed on people. That kind of sharp as a knife journalism. Well, he had done a great job. And he had half the legislator, Fletcher, PO'd with him. Because they never knew when his knife was going to come out. So the publisher thought, well, I need a real cowboy like Lloyd in this job. And the managing editor is a nice guy. He's a real sweetheart. Staff loves him. He's not a ram. Mm -hmm. He's not the kind of guy that's going to kick people in the butt and not a great newspaper. So they reached over in the left field and they brought Wickenburg in. And Wickenburg and I, I thought were like this. Right? I found out we were like this. Well, they then slapped me in the face. They brought in my old fraternity brother as news editor and put him over me. I told my wife, sweetheart, I'm getting my resume up today. My old city editor in Charlotte had gone to New York and he called me. And he said, I need a really good editor here. Do you think you and your wife would move to New York? I went home and I said, she was five months pregnant. I said, do you want to move with me to New York? And our child be born in New York mm -hmm. a month before Christmas, where we don't know anybody except the guy who's offered me the job. Mm -hmm. She's an Air Force brand. She said, I'm used to moving. Yeah. Let's go do it. It'll be an adventure. But I've taken Lloyd's dream, and it's become our dream. Oh. Through, you're not going to believe this, Tracy. I edited 13 newspapers at one time. I had wow. a lot of help. I had a lot of other editors helping me do it, but uh -huh. I was the big boss. But I have taken that dream through 26 newspapers. We edit, two, we edit two newspapers and yes. that's the dream. Oh it's to be God. a newspaper that embraces its readers. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, that's our vision. That's our vision. I love it. I love it. All right. So, Jerry, anything else that you would like to leave with our leaders that are listening that we haven't already touched on? Sure. I'll give you a couple of things that have, have really proved beneficial to my wife and our sons and, and me. One is never ask anybody to do anything you wouldn't do yourself. Okay. Mm -hmm. I mean, if it's cleaning a grease trap in the army, you want somebody to clean it, you ought to be willing to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. If it's vacuum the carpets, if it's carry out the trash, if it's do the dishes in the kitchen at the office, you're willing to do it and set an example by doing it. Mm -hmm. My son and I take out the trash. We do the dishes. Uh, we don't make their mother do it. She's doing plenty of other things, believe me. The other thing is when you hire people, design the job that you want them to do as if you were going to do it yourself. Okay. Make it the most exciting job you can make in the world. I always remember Martin Luther King's speech about the street sweeper. You probably remember this. He said in one of his sermons, 
if God assigns you to be a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper you can be. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter what you're doing in life, be the best you can be. So, and that's what people rise to. If you offer them a job that is just full of a sack of you know what, that they got to carry around all day, they're not going to work for you long because if they've got any brains at all, they're going to go find you a better job. Mm -hmm. someone who gives them some responsibility and respects their ability to think strategically. Now, in the morning at 9 o'clock, our staff and I meet. Uh, Our uh, news editor and our sports editor meet with us remotely on Zoom, just like we're doing right now. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the staff is there. Sales team is there. Uh, uh, Bookkeepers there. All of us are there. And we start off, the first thing we do is we have a report from the bookkeeper on our finances. I want our people to know that this is not only a cause, but a business. Okay, beautiful. We have, and we have to be profitable. Right, right. We can't be profitable. You know, we're, we're, we're not going to be any good to the community because we won't be able to support ourselves. Right, right. Then we, t- then we talk about what everybody else is doing. We talk about how we stand on subscriptions, how we stand on advertising, and what are the stories and photographs that we've got for next week's print edition, and what are the stories we're going to be working on and posting on our website. We posted 11 stories on our website Monday. We posted 10 on our website yesterday. I just got the analytics for July. Our visits to our website is north of 50,000 visits in one month. That's 1,600 visitors, 1,600 plus visitors a day. Wow. Most of them in eight to nine hours during the month. So do the math. A lot of people, a lot of people reading our news. Love it. Of course, we pull down a lot of the stuff that we put online and put it in the front edition of the news. Mm -hmm. And we do, we do, we publish two newspapers. We have a free newspaper called the Lake Murray Fish River. That's where we live. Uh-huh. Right, outside, right outside of these windows is Lake Murray. It's 45 miles long, 18 miles wide, right here in central South Carolina. Some of the best striped bass fishing in the world. We have striped bass fishing tournaments here. People come from other countries to compete in this, in these tournaments. This is where we wanted to live. That was our dream the last five years we were in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Coming home to South Carolina, getting the little local newspaper and living on Lake Murray. And we did it. I love it. Well, congratulations, Jerry. I love you wrapping that up. Now, how can folks get in touch with you? What's your newspaper? How do they get um, access to to all that you're putting out? Right. The print, uh, the... uh, the print and digital newspaper, the uh, subscriber newspaper. Yes. It's called the Lexington County Chronicle. Okay. We're in a county, we're in a county with 300,000 people. The, uh, you can go online, lexingtonchronicle.com. Okay. It's spelled just like Lexington, Massachusetts. Mm-hmm. A lot of states or communities, because of Lexington and Concord, adopted Lexington is there. My wife and I drove out to New Mexico several years ago, and we stopped at every Lexington in every state oh, neat. here in New Mexico and visited with the newspaper editors and publishers there. We had a great time. The, uh, my personal website, where my books are and where you can sign up to get my free business blog newsletter, comes out every week is Jerry Balloon, B-E-L-L-U-N-E. And if you'll put that on the podcast. Mm-hmm. I sure will. It's J-E-R-R-Y, B as in baseball, E-L-L-U-N-E, dot net. You can also do dot com or dot biz. It, it'll go to the same site. And you can get one of my free books there, which you and Liv got called Uncover Your Inner Sales Genius. Uh-huh. 
And the reason I chose that name was I had a young lady working for us. She was our first neighborhood columnist. She wrote something called Around Lexington. Um, and Judy was one of those fireballs. She knew everybody in town. And she wrote this wonderful column that had 75 or 80 local names in it every week. And she got offered a job by the power company, the local utility, South Carolina Electric and Gas, to sell gas to builders, to put gas in the homes for cooking or whatever you want, you know, eating or whatever. And they offered her such a deal with stuff I couldn't offer, you know, golden parachutes, health insurance. Uh, right. Yeah. You know, all the stuff little little guys like us can't afford. And so I encouraged her to do it. I, she said, well, I don't know that I've ever sold anything. I said, Judy, you sold me on you. Mm. I, I think, it, well, she is their top gas salesperson. Oh. And so I wrote a piece about that, that all of us have hidden talents that we're yes. not aware that we have. Yes. They all come from you know where, and we're smart if we use them. And I said, I lost one of the best columnists we, we had because I encouraged her to take another chance. Mm -hmm. And I've always, one of the things that always impressed me about Lou Holmes, Lou came down here and coached the Gamecocks for five years and, and did, did a marvelous job. But one of the things he, he told us all once we were out at Carolina Stadium for a dinner, and he said, I am so proud of my assistant coaches. He started naming them. So and so is at Notre Dame. So and so is at Texas Tech. So and so is at the University of Southern California. These were all head coaches now who had coached for Lou at William and Mary, at Wisconsin, at Notre Dame, at South Carolina. Uh, he said, I want to train our guys to become head coaches too. And he said, I know I'm going to lose them. I know I'm going to miss them. But he said, I know there's another guy coming down the pike. It's going to be just as good as them. And I'm going to tutor him and I'm going to develop him up too. So I've always thought, you know, always take care of your people. You'll lose them. You'll lose the best ones, but enjoy them while you got them and send them on their way with a hug. So. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. All right, Jerry. Well, thank you so much to our listeners out there. Please reach out to Jerry. Get on his uh, website and sign up for his uh, weekly newspaper that comes out. I know I love seeing it come to my box. Check out his books and uh, please subscribe to our channel at Tremendous Leadership, Leaders on Leadership. And please, if you would do us the honor of drop us a comment. We answer all our comments and leave us the honor of a review or a rating or share this with other leaders out there who really are out there making a difference in people's lives. And Jerry, just thank you again so much for all that you brought to our listeners. Tremendous, Tracy. I thank you for the opportunity. It's been a, a wonderful conversation. It has been. It's been a real joy getting to know more about you and your journey. You have taught me a great deal, my friends. So thank you so much to our listeners out there. Thanks for being part of our tremendous tribe. Have a tremendous rest of the day and keep paying the price of leadership. Thank you for listening to Tremendous Leadership with Dr. Tracy Jones. Find out more about Dr. Jones at www.tremendousleadership.com. If you've been ignited by something you heard in this episode, let us know by leaving a review for Tremendous Leadership wherever you listen to podcasts or by sending us a message through www.tremendousleadership.com.